but this is Pentecost Sunday when you go to a Christian calendar. This is always the week that will come seven weeks after Easter. Easter kind of moves around, and so seven weeks ago, hard to believe, isn't it, was Easter? Man, time is passing fast, but that was seven weeks ago, and so whenever Easter happens on the Christian calendar, on the church calendar, then it's time for Pentecost Sunday. And so I want to give you a little history here, but also let you know today how it affects you today living in the United States of America in Orange County in 2022. Our general superintendent said this. This is the leader of our church, Doug Clay. He'll be with us in July speaking right here. An awesome leader, and I love what he had to say, that Pentecost is the celebration of the first harvest. I am praying that the summer of 2022, beginning with Pentecost, will be marked by one of the greatest harvest of souls our church has ever experienced. Now, when he's talking about that, he's talking about, and he should as being our leader, and again, he'll be here July 10th. Don't miss it when he speaks right here. We we love having him, but he's talking about the church worldwide. Amen to that for revival. But I like this quote because I'm praying that for this church right here. Orange County First Assembly, that's my concern that we have Pentecost, and this is Pentecost Sunday, but we have revival hit this church starting today, and then we just keep going until Jesus comes. So I agree with what he says, that this summer would be a great harvest of souls. And we're going to do everything that we can, whether it's kids, it's adults, it's giving out food, connecting with people. We're going to do everything that we can to see the Lord do that um, this summer, beginning this summer. So will you stand with me this morning and let's go to Acts chapter 2. This is where Pentecost came, where it began, where we get that title. Let's look how it affected those folks 2,000 years ago and what it means to us today. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. By the way, one accord, one place. This is why I am so passionate about one church. If you speak English, if you speak Spanish, I want us all part of one church. You speak another language, and we'll talk about languages today, but ones that you've learned, I I just believe this is God's will for us to be in one accord and in one place. So that's Orange County First Assembly, as well as the first church in Jerusalem. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. What a service they were having that day back at about 30 A.D. or so. And they were all filled. Say it with me. They were all filled. Say it with me again. They were all filled. One more time. They were all filled. Who was filled with the Holy Spirit? All. All were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. That word tongues means languages that they had not learned as the Spirit gave them utterance. Lord Jesus, we love you. We praise you. We lift up your mighty name, and we're so thankful for you coming and dying. And then when you left, you sent us the Holy Spirit that does so much for us, comforts us when we're down, when we're depressed, empowers us when we need power to be bold for witnessing for you, Lord. The Holy Spirit is just so powerful. You sent that gift to us, And Lord, may I represent that to your dear people that are here today inside our church and that are watching online, Lord Jesus. Again, Lord, it's always the case. I have to decrease. I'm nothing. You're everything. Touch us today. Fire us up, Lord Jesus. So now that this summer, this Sunday, begins revival at Orange County First Assembly. You can do it. You've done it before. That's my expectation. Bless your people. In your name, Jesus, everybody said amen. You can be seated this morning. Thank you so much for being here. My first thought for you today is the people of Pentecost. Who were they? Who are we today? The people of 
Pentecost if you're taking notes today. There's three Jewish feasts. It was commanded in Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. God commanded to Moses, and he passed it along to all the Jewish families to remember what God has done, had done for them. Has God done anything great for you? Raise your hand. Have you ever been touched by God? Have you ever been blessed by our Lord? Don't forget it. Write it down. Put it somewhere where you don't forget all the blessings of the Lord. And if you didn't raise your hand, think a little deeper. Because he blesses us all time and time again. So three Jewish feasts. And through Moses to the Jewish folks, when they got to the promised land, which is Israel, he was telling them this, don't forget that celebrate, have a feast, and have it go for seven days, all three of these Jewish feasts, so you don't forget the goodness of God to you. So one of those feasts, and you've heard of it, is Passover. It's about the same time that we celebrate Easter but if you're new, what this feast meant was, and you can go to Exodus and look at the, those chapters there as God was bringing Israel, the Jews, out of Egypt. And so he would put 10 plagues on Egypt to get his people free. And the 10th one that did it was this. If you did not put blood from a pure lamb over your doorpost and the side post, if you did not have that, at midnight the death angel was going to come and kill the firstborn of your family and not just your children, but the firstborn of your animals. Very serious to God getting a message through. So the Jewish folks, they would get a pure lamb. They did. They killed that pure lamb. We know pure lamb, we know blood, what that was a symbol of, the Lord Jesus Christ. So it wasn't just saving them then, but it was a, a symbol of the future. And so they put that blood over their doorpost, and as the death angel came, the death angel passed over, right? Passed over the Jewish nation as long as they put the blood over their doorpost. But the Egyptians that night, many babies, those firstborn animals, were lost, and so God set his people free. A, a kind of a takeaway for us today is a reminder that God wants to set us free. Whatever we're in captive to, whatever we're chained to, he still does it today. God still sets his people free. That's you and me. But this was one of the feasts they would celebrate for a week to remember when God took them out of Egypt after they'd been captive there, slaves there, for over 400 years. Another uh, feast was the Feast of the Tabernacles. Though it didn't have to take this long, but Israel, like us, sinned, and they would sin time and time again. So God gets them out of Egypt. He does the miracle of the Red Sea. And again, if you don't know these stories, you should read the Old Testament. It's really good too. New Testament about Jesus, fantastic, phenomenal. Read the Old Testament as well. And so he gets them out of Egypt. And what shouldn't have taken very long at all would be 40 years 40 years the people of Israel would cross, would be stuck in the desert. The Feast of Tabernacles then was God would supply. And it's a takeaway for us today. God is our provider. You have needs, just go to him. He provides. And so in the desert, the middle of the desert from Egypt heading to Israel, you know that's desert land. But God would supply trees and tree branches and all the materials where they could build little tabernacles. They could build little booths, little shelter from that summer heat all the way for 40 years until they got into their promised land. So God told Moses, when you get to your promised land, celebrate for a week. Don't forget, I provided shelter for you in the middle of the desert. God provides for us. By the way, you live in a house. You have a roof over your, over your head. 
you are renting that apartment or you own that house, you should be thankful to the Lord. This is what he did for Israel. He did a miracle in the middle of the desert that he provided shelter for them for 40 years. Unfortunately, we have thousands of people we know in our community. They have nowhere to live, and we love to help them any way the Lord allows us to. But if you have a roof, if you have a shelter... If you're going home today somewhere in Orange County or L.A. County, some of you, you come from all over, or San Fernando Valley, wherever you're coming from, some of you are coming from these places, and you're going home, and there's a roof over your head, give the Lord thanks. He's our provider. He makes it happen. He gives us enough money to pay these bills. Praise His holy name forever. The Feast of Tabernacles reminded them, thank you, Lord, for providing shelter in the heat of the desert for 40 years. Praise his name. And then there's Shavat. That's the Feast of the Harvest. So what the Jewish folks would do is they would bring what we call the first fruits. They would bring of their fruit. They would bring of the best of their animals, the first fruits. During this celebration, again, it's going to last for a week. And they're going to celebrate the Lord that he has given them food now. Again, he's our provider. If you've eaten a meal in the last 24 hours, you need to give him praise for that. And that's why we love as a church some people, they don't have much food these days. And we love providing food for our neighbors. We're thankful to give it out. You should be thankful. I'm thankful if we have food to eat. So they would bring the first fruits. And you've heard me talk about that before. When we talk about giving and tithing, giving of our money, all the blessings come from above. Tithing being 10% of your income if you're new. And it should be the first 10%. That's first fruits. You say, Pastor, I do that. I don't know that I'm going to make it. Test God. He actually says that. Test me and see. That's one of those tests God gives you. Test me and see. If you don't give me that first 10%, and if you do that and you give, he throws open the windows of heaven a blessing to us. Well, this is the principle with Israel. They bring their first fruits. They were thankful to the Lord that they'd had enough rain. They were thankful to the Lord that they had fertile soil where they could grow these crops. And so this time they would bring the very first, the very best, and they would offer it up to the Lord. It was harvest time every year when they would come back to Jerusalem and they would celebrate and thank the Lord for this. So normally in Jerusalem, and we're talking about that's where they would go. There was 30,000 people during this era that lived in within the walls of Jerusalem. Now, we're all Southern Californians from L.A. to Orange County. We know about traffic. So three times a year, oh, Jerusalem got busy. Not with traffic, not with cars, not with uh, chariots. People. Three times a year during these three feasts, 100,000 people would be within the gates of Jerusalem, packed side by side, but happy, celebrating, thanking the Lord for a place to live that they remembered, for food to eat, for God passing over and saving their generations from time and time again. So Jerusalem was crowded big time during these three feasts that they celebrated every year during this time. So the day of harvest we're looking at today, the first fruits, that's what we're talking about. That's what Pentecost became. Pentecost means 50. What happened after they brought that, those first fruits, presented it to the Lord, this Sunday, Pentecost, that we're celebrating today, it would be 50 days later that the Holy Spirit would come. And I'm going to show that to you. And isn't God amazing that what was harvest time, we could say, when they brought their fruit and vegetables and their animals and, and gave it to the Lord, gave it back to the Lord to thank Him for that, that the Holy Spirit comes and it's harvest time again. It's harvest time for the world. It's harvest for people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. God is so amazing and so cool. Praise His name. Pentecost equals 50, 50 days after this. 
Now, all of them were filled. Let's say it again. All of them. Say it again. All of them. Up top, you with me? All of them. Making sure everybody's awake now. All right, very good. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit on that first Pentecost day. Now, some theologians say it's not for today. Speaking in tongues or speaking literally in languages you've never learned, but the Holy Spirit comes on you and you speak this out. You didn't learn that language. And so there's theologians who would say it's not for today. The purpose of tongues, the purpose of languages is that the first church needed it to get the gospel out. And boy, did they take the gospel out. It's why we're here today. They did a great job with this. But this is not the case. It is for today. Look what Peter said. For the promise is to you. He's preaching on this day. And to your children. And to all who are afar off. And as many as the Lord our God will call. So he was saying it's for us is for our children and all those afar off. I want you to raise your hand if you're afar off. Raise your hand. That's all of you. You're afar off. It's been 2,000 years since Peter said that. We're afar off. It's for us today. Peter prophesied that. And if it isn't for us today, why is this happening? 600 million Pentecostals worldwide and growing and counting every day. If it wasn't for today, there'd be less. There's never been more people being filled with the Holy Spirit worldwide. It is for today. Praise the Lord. Peter prophesied it, predicted it, and it's happening. So it's the beginning of the church was Pentecost Sunday. Today is the birthday of the church. Reach over to somebody next to you and say, happy birthday. Just tell them, it's everybody's birthday today. If you go to a Christian church in the world and then that church happens to be Pentecostal like us, it's the birthday of the church starting around 30 AD in the springtime. This is our birthday, the beginning of the church as we know it. Now, you might say, well, pastor, who is a candidate to be filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm a sinner. I make mistakes. This sounds like something special. Peter and the apostles were filled. They were special men. Who is a candidate to be filled in the Holy Spirit? The only thing you need to do before this is that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That comes first. That's what gets you into heaven. That's the most important thing. So if you've done that, then you might be a candidate to receive the Holy Spirit today. Now let's see who are candidates that we find from Scripture. Jews and Gentiles. If you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, you can receive the Holy Spirit. Last I checked, that's all of us. We're all one or the other. You're either Jewish or you're a Gentile or you might have some Jewish blood, but you might have some Gentile blood in you. Jews and Gentiles can receive the Holy Spirit. Men and women, well, if you're not a Jew or a Gentile, you certainly are this. You're either a man or a woman in here today, and so everyone can receive the Holy Spirit. Everyone is a candidate to receive. Young and old, that's good news. It doesn't matter your age. You can receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in other languages that you never learned. I have seen at the camps that we used to run, I have seen eight years old people, ladies and gentlemen, speaking in other tongues and other languages. I went right up to them to just see what they were saying. We didn't know. It was a language from heaven or a language from some other part of the world. Didn't know, but they were full of the Holy Spirit. Eight-year-old kids. Of course, I've seen thousands of teenagers. That's most of the work that we ever did. Filled with the Holy Spirit. I've seen a bunch of older people like us. Filled with the Holy Spirit. You're a candidate. Well, if you're young or old, you're a candidate to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Who's a candidate to be filled in the Holy Spirit? If you're hungry for more of God, do you want more of God? And I pray that you do. I pray that you all want more, that you're not satisfied with your life. You say, well, Pastor, 
Jesus has been so good to me. We should never be satisfied. If he's willing to give us more, come on. When you were a kid and your parents maybe gave you one gift for Christmas, you wanted more. Is that it? Isn't there more gifts? Yeah, we can be spoiled kids sometimes for sure. But if Jesus is giving a gift saying, I want to give you the Holy Spirit, shouldn't we take that gift from Jesus? Do you want more from God? Are you hungry for more from God? I pray that you are. The more of us that are hungry for God, the faster revival is going to hit this church. Praise the Lord. If you want to be used by God, hey, this was my prayer as a teenager. God, I don't have many talents. I don't have many abilities. But if you can use me, I'm available. So I'll take any help, any gift you give me, use my life. And I can't believe how the Lord has used my life since that prayer as a teenager. You want to be used by God? You're a candidate for the Holy Spirit. You're a candidate for the, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you need personal revival, the team led us in a song today about put a fire in my soul. If you need to fire up, if you need to heat up for Jesus, you're a candidate for the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Holy Spirit today. And then if you are dry. So I'm thinking a lot of people the last two years or so are dry. You've been beat up by this culture. It might be family problems. It could be financial problems. Some of you that are watching me today because you let me know you wouldn't be able to make it today, but you'd be watching. It's physical. Your physical bodies have been beat up recently. You might be dry. We're talking about spiritually dry. We're talking about being a candidate for the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus let us know the remedy when we're dry and when we're thirsty. In John 7, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. If you're thirsty, if you're dry, if you're hungry spiritually, the Holy Spirit is for you. So let's just make sure this has happened. Did Jesus come? Yes or no? Did he come to this earth? Well, we know hundreds of people saw him, so that's true. Did he die for us on the cross? We know that's true. Did he rise from the dead? We know that's true. 500 people at least saw him alive. We know that's true. Did he ascend back to his Father in heaven? Is he sitting at the right hand of the Father now? Is he coming back one of these days? All of this is yes, so he has been glorified. Therefore, since our Lord has been glorified, you are a candidate to receive the Holy Spirit because he conquered, he accomplished his mission, and now the Holy Spirit roaming the earth looking for who's ready to be full, who's ready to have their thirst quenched, who's hungry, who's dry, the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit is for everyone. Do you get it? There's no way you weren't one or two or more of those categories that I put up there as far as candidates for the Holy Spirit. Number two is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to go back a few days before our story today to Peter and what's happening as Jesus is on trial. So watch this with me now, okay? Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. Peter, the man who said, Everybody else forsakes you, Lord. I'll never forsake you. 
not only had he forsaken the Lord, and he had just said that a few hours before that night, not only had he forsaken the Lord, he was lying about him. We would call this, in our modern term, Peter had backslidden. He had followed the Lord for th over three years, but at this moment, not serving the Lord. But I got good news for you. Peter came back. If you've backslidden, if you're watching me today, you've gotten away from the Lord. Jesus is saying, come on back. You can come back today. Peter did this, and everything would change in approximately 52 days. 52 days before Pentecost, Peter denying the Lord, and many of the same crowd because they had come for Passover to Jerusalem. Remember that crowd, thousands of people saying, crucify him, crucify him. The worst words that anyone could say to our Lord. This crowd is there. They were there for Passover, and seven weeks later they have come back now for the Feast of the Harvest, and isn't that interesting God's timing that he fills Peter and the disciples, by the way, women also, it's mentioned in Acts, Mary, the mother of Jesus, other women getting filled with the Holy Spirit, and then thousands of people who 50 days before said crucify him, now coming to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Spirit is poured out through Peter preaching. It's amazing the transformation that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's a game changer. You need the Holy Spirit flowing in your life. It draws you to Jesus. If you've ever felt guilty, if you've ever felt sinful, I need to get right with God. I shouldn't have done that. Do you know why you feel that way? It's the Holy Spirit. He's drawing you to Jesus. He's convicting you. It's always the Holy Spirit working on you to get closer to Jesus. Boldness to witness. This happened to Peter. He denies the Lord before a few people. But as we see on the day of Pentecost, he's going to preach to thousands. Boldness to witness. Happened to me too. Happened to Peter. It will happen to you as, w as well. And then it's a sign of the end times. We always talk about, are we living in the end times? Well, Peter would preach it. It's Acts chapter 2. It's a sign that we're in the end these days. Peter preaching the prophecy of Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Hey, I'm excited about that. Old men dreaming dreams. Not bad dreams, dreams of vision of what the Lord wants to do for us. Young and old, dreaming, prophesying. That's what we want in our church to happen again. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. These, this is what the Holy Spirit does. It's another sign we're living in the end times, as we saw as Pentecost, the Pentecostal experience is just exploding worldwide. The Holy Spirit changes your focus. The revival at Fallbrook, the Holy Spirit changed our focus. I'm talking about, I'm talking to you about growing up there with my mama and my mom-in-law and all these folks. Middle 70s, I was thinking about it this week. The Lord was working on me. He was working on a lot of different people, and he brought us together. I've talked to you about being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in another language all night long, 10 o'clock at night till, let's see, 5 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night till 3 o'clock in the morning. I was in my bedroom, out of my mind, you might say, with Jesus, speaking a language I had never known. It was going to just change my life that the next day I would witness, share the gospel for the first time with my math teacher. I wish I could tell you he got saved. He didn't get saved. But he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't done with me yet because he would be my driver's ed teacher. So he's in the car for an hour after that. And I'm talking to him what had happened to me. He didn't accept the Lord at least then, but another hour with him. The Lord blessed me that I could be a class speaker at Fallbrook High School, our graduation. 
So there was a thousand people or so at that graduation, teachers, parents, kids, you know. And so you had to turn in your speech before you gave your speech. And I turned in my speech and my ASB president said, great, no problem. You can mention that God is meaningful to you, important in your life. Just do not say Jesus Christ. In fact, I'd put in my speech, Jesus Christ is God. He's meaningful to me, and he is God. Because I thought, I have one chance. I'll never talk to these people again. I haven't talked to them since. They'd have to watch us online maybe and say, I remember that crazy 18-year-old at that high school graduation and not speaking great, but getting that point across. And so I really prayed about it, and I thought, it's enough. It's enough to say God is meaningful to me. And I felt just so, it's the Holy Spirit again, no, I have to say Jesus Christ. And so I did, and I was happy I did that. The principal was very mad at me. I thought, am I even going to get my diploma? He grudgingly gave me my diploma. But I was glad I could do that. But it wasn't just me, because a family from Northern California moved down, and it was Lisa and her sisters and her brother and her mom and dad, and they came down, and they came to the church, and we had these Christian girls in our youth group. And then Fallbrook's known as the avocado capital of the world. It's a pretty little town full of avocado trees. It also has to be the marijuana capital of the world, too. The soil is fertile. It's beautiful. It's green. So at lunchtime at Fallbrook High, you could just smell many people getting high. They're smoking pot out there somewhere. Smoke in the air. You could smell it every day at lunchtime. But then suddenly... Some hippies started getting saved. They started coming to our church. They started getting delivered from drugs, and they hadn't been part of our church, but they started coming. Even young adults that were into drugs started coming to our church, and I was thinking about it this week. It wasn't 10 years. It was about five years' time in the middle 70s. We had to build another church building. We had such a revival happening. Our church in Fallbrook, tripled in about five years time it was the revival at Fallbrook the Holy Spirit hit us I'm sure some grandmas and others were praying for revival but the Holy Spirit hit me hit our youth group hit others and totally changed our focus where we we're looking at things of this world now we were looking at things of God the things of God the Holy Spirit he's the one who changes things Praise God. Finally, the plan. What's the plan then? Peter preached it. Now, when he heard this, when they heard this, Peter's been preaching. Read Acts 2 this week. They were cut to the heart. That's the Holy Spirit working on their hearts. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Because they've been in the upper room, 120 people, by the way, about the size of the people that we have here today, probably. 120 people changed the world forever. There's a hundred something here today. Right here. People on vacation, whatever. We love them. Praise God they could go. I'm talking about people right here in this house could change this world if we fire up in the holy people who are present today because it's happened before and it can happen again men and brethren what shall we do then peter said to them remember this guy who denied the lord 52 days or so before now he's preaching to thousands wow he's fired up Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And look what happened. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Baptized in water. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to the church. If it happened there, you know how much I'm just fascinated with that number 3,000. I'm just fascinated about that number. If it happened before, why not again? Why not again? Why couldn't it happen again? Did God love those people 2,000 years ago more or the same? 
then it could happen again. Revival could hit this church right here, and I'm believing for that. So here's the plan. Sinners get hungry for God. They don't know it sometimes, but they're hungry for God. They're wondering, I need something else, money and fame and all of this. It doesn't satisfy. We saw a couple on trial this, this week, famous couple. They didn't look too happy to me. They had it all. They had riches and fame. They seemed pretty miserable, those two people. You know who I'm talking about. What are they looking for? They didn't have God. That's what they needed, both of those people. They needed the Lord Jesus Christ in their life because obviously relationship, money, and fame didn't do it. Sinners get hungry for God. Sinners repent. Now, a reminder, you're going one way, doing your own thing. The Holy Spirit draws you. You repent. You pray the prayer that we'll pray in a few moments. It, that is, but that's where you start. Now, repent means you turn around. It's 180 degrees. And now you start following Jesus the rest of your life. So you pray the prayer. That's the beginning. Sinners repent. You turn around. Now you're following Jesus is leading you. That's the plan. They believed the gospel of Jesus Christ that Peter was preaching. They were baptized in water. Why? Because it's a public witness, and it's so symbolic. If you haven't been baptized in water, we love to do that here, right back here by this cross, underneath this cross. We turn that into a tank. You could be baptized in water. It's public. That's why you are to do that. And then you might receive, your will, you're a candidate to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit if you want it. Now, you don't have to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. You say, Pastor, okay, I'll wait to get baptized. Then I'll ask you to pray for me to get filled with the Holy Spirit. You could be filled with the Holy Spirit any time after you've come to salvation. What's super cool, I just, I just so want this to happen sometime, Lord, if you'll bless me this way. Many times I have baptized people. When they come out of that water, I'm thinking they're going to just start speaking in tongues in another language right now. They're so blessed, and that's happened to me all over the world. They're ready to speak in this other language. It could happen at the same time. As long as you're saved, you've repented, you've come to Jesus Christ, be baptized in water. That's the model from Scripture. And then if you want the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I highly recommend that gift to you, then that's next on the agenda after you come to Jesus Christ. So I was reading a little bit, and you may have heard about Azusa Street, downtown Los Angeles, a revival that hit there in 1906. Dad, why don't we stand this morning? Worship team, why don't you come back, and let's begin to, to wrap it up. And we are going to pray for you if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We'll first pray for salvation in a moment. Please stand. You can stand. I want you to stand. But I want to tell you a little bit about my reading and research about Azusa Street. This is Little Tokyo these days in Los Angeles. That's the area, all right? That's a point of reference for you if you've gone downtown Los Angeles. That's the place, all right? But in 1900, historians, Christian historians, historians said our country in 1900 had spiritual stagnation. Does that sound like Anything you've heard of lately? Spiritual stagnation. That's our world today. That's 1900. So a bunch of preachers began to pray. Now I want you to know that I'm working on some new models, not radical, whatever, but just times. And we pray every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m. You're welcome to join us for that as Mr. Mike Newcomb leads us. That's an awesome time. But I'm working on some new models that I'm going to share with you as we get towards September of corporate prayer, of us coming together and praying for revival together. So I'm working on it. Get ready. All right? Get ready. But preachers would pray. They were praying because it was so spiritually dry in our country. They also began to preach on Jesus was coming soon. That was a model of those, those preachers of the early of 1900s. He hasn't come, but we're getting closer. We're getting closer all the time. And it's from Scripture. And so people were getting saved, and then people felt like, well, if he's coming soon, then I need to tell others about Jesus Christ. 
And so evangelism began to happen, personal evangelism, not just like I'm doing where I'm preaching, but you all with your family and people you work with and people you hang out, that you would tell others one of these days, Jesus Christ is coming back. By the way, we might as well be truthful. There is a heaven. There is a hell. Some people are going to go to hell, but Jesus doesn't want anybody in, the, in hell. So we should tell the truth. We should tell it in love. This is Jesus. He wants everybody, every human being in heaven. We make a choice. If we're going to go to hell, we may, we we made that choice. Some preachers are doing that. You've heard hellfire and brimstone. That's just a little bit of that. They would preach this during that particular era, and evangelism would happen. Then God was good because they were praying, and miracles began to happen. I read reports, and we've had this in more modern times, but I read reports of cancerous tumors in bodies just shrinking, dying automatically, and falling out of bodies. How radically cool is God that He cares about us, that He can heal us instantly, even from cancer, COVID, or anything else. And some of you are home today, you're sick. I've been praying for you that God would heal you before we part ways today. Praise the Lord. This began to happen. Three pastors, they started in the South or Midwest, Kansas and Texas. They would come to Los Angeles and they would be involved in this revival as you read history. Charles Parham, William Seymour, who was an African-American preacher, and Frank Bartleman. They were all drawn to Los Angeles and Frank Bartleman would write a lot of history about what happened at Azusa Street, this major revival. By the way, out of that revival would come the Assemblies of God, our churches, would come the Foursquare Church, would come the Church of God in Christ, would all come out of that Azusa Street revival, a mighty moving that would affect the world. It's still affecting the world today, over a hundred years later. So they would ask, they asked these pastors, and Frank Bartleman said, what was the common characteristics of these folks? They were hungry for God, and they were humble before God. They would humble themselves and say, God, I want you, and I'm hungry. I'm hungry for more of you. Frank Bartleman would say it, we wanted God. We wanted to meet God, desperate for Him. So to review, the people of Pentecost, everyone is a candidate to receive the Holy Spirit. You want Him, He will come into your life. you got to want Him. To review, the purpose, He's a game changer. He'll do a lot for you, but He'll make you a bold witness like you've never been before totally change Peter's life forever. To review the plan, be hungry for God, my friends. Repent of your sins. Be baptized in water and let everybody know that Jesus Christ is your Lord. And then if you like, you have the opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Before we pray for you about that, if you're interested in being filled this morning, would anyone be here? Up top, down low, and first you need to repent of your sin. You need to come back to the Lord. Peter had to come back to the Lord before God would use him, and God used him in a powerful way after he repented of denying his Lord. Is there anyone here that you're either not a Christian you used to be a Christian. You've backslidden. This is where it begins. This is the most important thing. This is how you go to heaven is you repent. He forgives you of your sin and you make a commitment. Now I'm not going back to that lifestyle. I'm going forward with Jesus. Raise your hand. If I can pray for you today. I see that hand. I see that hand. Raise your hand if you need to repent today because Jesus is waiting and he'll forgive you of your sins and this is the beginning. All right, let's all pray. Will you repeat after me? Mean it from your heart. If you mean that, he wipes away all your sins. He forgets all your sins. It's the first step and then we'll be ready to pray if you'd like to receive anyone 
would like to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit today. Please repeat after me. Mean it from your heart. Even if you're a follower of Jesus, help me this morning. It's encouraging to do this. Lord Jesus, I'm coming to you. I ask you to forgive me every sin, every mistake. I ask you to be Lord of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life. For the rest of my life, I make a commitment to you. Forgive me. Help me. Lead me. I will follow you all the way to heaven. You are my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in your mighty name. Everybody said amen, amen. Now we should clap. We should celebrate. This is why we're here. We don't do this. Then we've wasted your time. But we do this. It's not a waste of time for us to come together and give people an opportunity. Some of you I've asked to come forward and be a prayer partner today. If you'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, now let me give you instruction. Because we've all seen some crazy things on television, all right? And it makes people scared, all right? If I've asked you to pray, please come forward and join me here at the front. Prayer partners praying for those to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, a language you've never learned, but also boldness to be a witness starting tomorrow like I was, all right? We're not going to push you over. We've seen that in America sometimes. We're going to do what the Apostle Paul did. The Apostle Paul, check it out, Acts 19. He goes to Ephesus. He prays for 12 believers. They all receive the Holy Spirit. He just calmly laid his hand on them, their head, their shoulder. That's what we're going to do. No force. And let's just see what Jesus is going to do here in the house before we leave today. Fill you up with the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you're dry. You need a fresh touch of him. He will do this for you. So we're going to pray. Comment. What do you do? I suggest raise your hands. Pray in English. Pray in Spanish. Whatever language you know, pray in that language. And then the Lord, if he fills you now, there'll be another language. It'll just come from heaven. Let it go because we're here with you to pray. Now, if you don't receive right now, we're believing. I've been praying that people would receive, but we're ready to pray. I better shut up and get after it. I've been praying. You receive, praise the Lord. You don't receive myself. I went home from church and at night in my bed, I started speaking in other tongues. You want him, Jesus? You want the Holy Spirit? You're going to get the Holy Spirit. It could be right now. It could be right now. So let me pray and then we're going to worship and you're welcome to come to these brothers and sisters as we pray for you today. Lord Jesus, we are hungry for you. We want personal revival in our own souls. We want corporate revival in this church. So as we have sang that song, and we'll sing it again, Holy Spirit, part of the Godhead, part of the Trinity, your God also, you are welcome in this place. We are hungry for you. We're humble. We can't do it ourselves. We need you. Lord Jesus, fill your people today in your name. Amen. Let's worship and please come forward if you'd like to be prayed. Hello, I'm Sarah and I'm the kids pastor here at OCFA. I am so glad that you joined us today for service and I pray it was a blessing to you. I want to encourage you to connect with us online on Facebook or Instagram or visit our website at ocfirstag.com. And I hope to see you next week.